fatalities have increased according to National Nurses United. Uh, minorities have gotten less care, greater exposure, and close working conditions cause them to get COVID at a 33% higher rate. Uh, so there are income and racial inequalities. PPE equipment and bed availability has suffered. Uh, there are financial barriers to treatment. And I could go on and on with these. It, it's just an amazing list of things that have become apparent during this COVID uh, era. So I would just say, keep your eyes and ears open uh, when we are able to release this. I'm gonna have the spokesperson from Span Ohio on our uh, webcast on Wednesday night. Um, and Connie has put out the, uh, the, the, the link to that. Uh, he's going to be on there and he will talk about this some more and he's inviting people to do take up various parts of it and try to uh, fill in the, the gaps of information. So I hope you'll stay tuned and keep your eye open. We want to pass Medicare for all. The country needs it. We all need it. Let's go. What do you think that uh, Joe Biden's going to do about this? I don't think he's on board, but I think he can be made to be on board. And that's what we all have to have to be about. You know, you don't ever you don't ever start off from a compromising position when you want to you want something done in Congress. You start out with what it is that you want, and you don't take anything else. And I think that's what we in the single payer movement are going to do. We're not going to stand and wait for tinkering with, oh, you know, we'll we'll, we'll, we'll include pre-existing conditions and we'll we'll continue the ACA and. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do these little things that we can do. No, we want the whole enchilada and we're not gonna back down until we get it. That is so, so coincidental that you should say that because the one, I was telling y'all that uh, Dave Swanson came and spoke here several years ago. Seems like it was recently, but it was a long time ago. And the one thing that he, he was emphasizing in his speech to us back then was activists don't compromise. That's not our job. It's, mm -hmm. it's the job of the people after we convince them it needs to be done to compromise. We have to stay firm on what our ideal uh, demands welcome. are. So thank you very much, Bob. That is exactly what we need to do. You're welcome. So is anything else happening with Span Ohio in January other than this webcast? Uh, uh, not right now. We are going to be trying to do some lobbying activities uh, after the first of the year when the state house comes back, working primarily with the state house and with the uh, you know, I hope to have a, another visit with uh, Troy Balderson's office and at least talk to a staff person there and uh, see if we can uh, move anything in, in his direction. Um, Stivers and he are uh, have not been willing to meet with us directly. Um, and so Joyce Beatty has been a co-sponsor of the legislation for, um, for her time in Congress. Oh, good, good. Well, thank you very, very much. And with a little bit of time we have left before it's time for Dave to speak, um, we're gonna have Bob talking quickly about elections. This is Al Gobble, can you hear me? This is Al Gobble. We can hear you, Al. What's on okay. your mind? Uh, I have a couple of comments I'd like to make. One is this whole HB6 fiasco could be solved by passing a very sh small sh bill into law just rescinding HB6 immediately so that charges. We lost you. You muted yourself. You did something. Uh, we're not hearing you anymore. Can you unmute him, Steve? No, he has to unmute himself. Uh, you hit something that muted you. We can't hear you. Al, try to undo and unmute okay. yourself. Yeah, now, now you can hear me. Uh, yes, yes. Well, the, the thing I said is <clears throat> it would be very simple to pass a very small bill into law to rescind HB6 and the whole fiasco would go away. And it could be done so that it would take immediately, take effect immediately, and we wouldn't have charges on our electric bill this coming January. But it won't happen because the Republicans have complete control. The, the, other, the, the other thing I might say is, I am a member of Bob's organization, 
the single payer. I've been working with them for a decade and I'm very, very um, much in favor of, of their cause. Um, the thing I really wanna talk about is the fact that we need to get control, of, the Democrats need to get control in the Senate. For that to happen, Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff must win their seats in the U.S. Senate in the runoff election in Georgia on January the 6th. Uh, in, on the November 3rd election, Democrats lost one seat, the Doug Jones seat from Alabama, and won two, Hickenlooper in Colorado and Mark Kelly in Arizona. But the Republican senators won re-election to, to all the rest. And therefore, it appears that Mitch McConnell will remain as majority leader of the Senate. That would make it impossible for Biden administration to rescind any of the draconian laws passed during the Trump administration and to pass progressive legislation. However, if Warnock and Ossoff win both Georgia seats, Vice President Harris, who, it will, who will be the president of the Senate, breaks ties, and therefore she would vote to have Charles Schumer to be the majority leader. And what more importantly, Democrats would chair all of the Senate committees. So, I, I, rec I, I urge everybody to send political donations to Warnock and Ossoff and encourage others to do so. You make out the checks or credit card donations to Raphael Warnock, Warnoff for U.S. Senate and to John Ossoff for U.S. Senate and sign a statement saying that you are in compliance with the, with the contribution rules. And I have the addresses uh, to send them to. One other thing we can do to help is uh, get in contact with their campaigns. And I have given the addresses of the campaigns uh, in, 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 to the free press. Uh, on the date, day of the election, that's the 5th of, of January, uh, we can phone bank to help get out the vote on that day. So we really need to get control. If we don't have control, uh, uh, Mitch McConnell is just going to wreak havoc uh, with, with the Biden administration and trying to uh, right all the wrongs. Yeah, we we got you. We got you, Al. In fact, it's funny that you were saying all this right now because that was what Bob was going to talk about. So he's got a few things to add, and then we're going to have our keynotes. Yeah, speaker. good, good job. Thank you very much, Al. Right. Uh, just briefly, since we're a 501c3 and not directly partisan, uh, Andrea Miller, uh, anyone know Andrea Miller with the Center for Common Ground in Virginia? Uh, contact her organization. Uh, if you can, they're, they're sending, giving a phone call, a text, and a Gmail uh, to every person of color uh, in the state of Georgia. What is it called? Uh, it's called Center for Common Ground. It's based mm -hmm. in Virginia. Uh, and uh, also the NAACP of Atlanta, uh, Ray McClendon, uh, another huge operation among uh, people of color, which should be the key. Uh, there was a million more voters, primarily uh, people of color, uh, in this year's election in Georgia, which is why Biden won there over 2018. So a million voters were added, overwhelmingly uh, people of color. So that was NAACP, Georgia, Atlanta. Atlanta. Uh, yeah. Okay, and both of those are just into getting out the vote for all people. Uh, so uh, we'll keep that in mind. And uh, uh, I also would uh, like to briefly mention uh, the union I co-founded, Columbus State Educational Association, 
signed a contract with over 200 yeses and two noes. The key issue uh, wasn't money. Uh, we turned down money. Uh, it was they were going to take away the accumulated sick days for the annual contracted faculty. So uh, I'm very proud of the uh, uh, professors, uh, uh, particularly many of us who are full professors who, who gave up the money and refused to allow, you may have seen this in the paper, we actually, there was a story that was leaked. Uh, but yeah, in the middle of the pandemic, they thought they would go after the one year annual faculty and uh, have them surrender every year their accumulated sick days during the pandemic. So uh, I think a good model for social justice. That might be something Bob Cousin want, might want to add to his uh, list <laughs> to send to. Yeah, Congress. and Tom Shanahan, I'm sure the union president, <laughs> Tom Shanahan, but uh, I was uh, uh, very proud of uh, the union. Okay. All right, so it's time, it's way past time for you to introduce David Swanson. Okay, well, uh, uh, hopefully uh, some of you are familiar with David uh, Swanson. Uh, you may remember the Downing Street uh, uh, memos uh, uh, that showed uh, the uh, British in the United States uh, were kind of planning when to illegally attack Iraq, right? It, it was supposed to be this spontaneous surprise and instead they had their uh, uh, scheduling calendars out uh, deciding when this illegal and brutal war would be launched against a country that wasn't a threat to the United States. So uh, David Swanson uh, was the man responsible uh, for those leaks and publicizing it. Uh, I, of course, uh, first encountered him uh, when he was working on impeach uh, impeaching uh, Cheney and Bush. I believe it was in that order. Uh, Suzanne was with me uh, when he and uh, one of my heroes, Dennis Kucinich, approached us and said, you know, you should, uh, you know, work and donate to this project. And if you got any ideas, uh, and, and again, that was David Swanson. But uh, just briefly, because, you know, he has one of those very long biographies. Uh, he's an author, activist, journalist, uh, and radio talk show host, including uh, his show plays on WGRN 94.1. And we print all his, most of his articles on freepress.org, so you can find them on our website. And he's the executive director of World Beyond War, campaign coordinator for rootactions.org. Uh, numerous books, uh, War is Alive, uh, When the World Outlawed War. Uh, his website, always worth reading, davidswanson.org. Uh, and uh, again, He's also a Nobel Peace Prize nominee, much deserved. Suzanne and I went to uh, Cuba uh, after Obama opened it up uh, with David uh, as well. And in 2018, won a Peace Prize from the US Peace Memorial Foundation. Uh, and I think, of course, uh, his, his account of the Bush administration, uh, he wrote an incredible uh, book, uh, in great detail, uh, is why I like him as an investigative reporter, great detail uh, on documenting uh, everything illegal the Bush administration did. So with that in mind, uh, let me introduce my good friend, David Swanson. Uh, thank you, Bob and Suzanne, and some other familiar faces here. It's great to be here. Great to be with you guys. I wish I were uh, there in real world, uh, but maybe someday. Um, I, I got a chance uh, earlier today to write down and post on my uh, website, davidswanson.org, uh, what I called uh, 27 things you can do to let there be peace on earth. Uh, and if you wanna, and I put, you know, web links and, and how to actually get involved in each of these 27 things at the end of each item. So if you wanna go to davidswanson.org, it's the top uh, article there, but maybe I can list at least some of them and then we can talk about uh, the ones you wanna talk about or the things that are missing that should have been here that you wanna talk about. Um, so the, f the first point is that this past year, we saw that 
even taking 10% away from military spending in the US Congress, even during a deadly pandemic, even explicitly to move it to aiding people in a deadly pandemic is just taboo. It's just beyond the pale, cannot be done uh, without a lot more organizing and pressure and education and transformation. Uh, but some sort of something or other that's gonna get called a Green New Deal is on the table. And the very best chance of a decent Green New Deal with serious funding and serious uh, policy changes is to get some money out of the military. And the very best chance of getting any money out of the military and reducing the risk of nuclear apocalypse and, and the endless disasters of militarism is to get some of that money into a Green New Deal. So this is something we need to be talking to Congress members about, to allies and organizations about, to every single environmentalist organization uh, that uh, calls itself decent and humanitarian, but is afraid to mention the existence of the military budget. We need to be talking to them about this. Um, uh, and there's some links and some resources uh, in, the, in the article. Um, when this was happening months ago and Congress was refusing uh, in great bipartisan harmony uh, to take 10% out of militarism, a uh, congressman from Wisconsin, Pocan, and Congresswoman Barbara Lee from California announced that they were going to create a you know, so-called defense budget reduction caucus. So Congress members who want to get money out of militarism and into all things decent and good, uh, we're going to form a caucus. And then nothing's been heard of it since. Uh, and so there are petitions and efforts to get them to follow through, create the caucus, give it a website, list its, its members, let us lobby our Congress members to join it. What will it do, et cetera? Um, Number three on my list, the single biggest enemy of the Pentagon is not actually some two-bit military that spends 3% of what the U.S. does on militarism and is a great threat to the planet. No, it is college. It is free college. Uh, it is treating college as part of public education. And to the extent that we can make that happen, we will accomplish a tremendous good in itself as well as achieving the last thing the Pentagon wants. Uh, and, and there are countless organizations that are gonna be pushing this agenda, which, ha which has to start with canceling student debt. Uh, one of them is one I work for, rootsaction.org. Um, a lot of things have changed in, in these past four years. A lot of new things have happened. Uh, for one thing, a Congress for the first time has used the War Powers Resolution from back in the early 70s to end a war, the war on Yemen. Unfortunately, uh, Trump vetoed that. Uh, so, you know, we, we have to bring that up again. We have to, uh, we have to make sure that Congress does it again and Biden does not veto it. Uh, the other thing that's happened, uh, you know, the flip side of that is that Congress has developed this new uh, policy of forbidding a president to end wars. So they tried to end one war. Uh, they've forbidden Trump to pull troops out of Afghanistan, to pull troops out of Germany, for God's sake, 75 years would just be too rushed, or to, or even though he didn't even propose this, to pull troops out of Korea. Got to keep that Korean war going. And so, so we have to do away with this new policy that, as Rand Paul threw a fit about a couple days ago, uh, Congress allows presidents to start dozens of wars, but now thinks it can forbid presidents to end any wars, except again, the war on Yemen. So we have to, we have to go after this policy. Uh, and then we have to, number five on my list, we have to build on ending the war on Yemen to ending another war and another war. Once Congress shows it can do it, why can't it do it in Afghanistan? Why can't it do it in Syria, et cetera, end them all. Uh, and if we can, as part of ending the war on Yemen, end the sale of weapons to Saudi Arabia or United Arab Emirates, which the Senate voted down the latter a couple of days ago, uh, well then why can't we expand that to Congresswoman Omar's bill to stop arming all uh, abusers of human rights. 
uh, and expand that further to the understanding that you can't actually use weapons of war without abusing human rights and end the foreign arms trade. Uh, so there's, you know, petitions and links and how to sign on and how to promote and, and, and how to understand these issues. Um, we should get together a huge coalition when Congresswoman Omar reintroduces her package of legislation that she introduced last year, uh, the Peace Building Act, the Migration Agreement Act, the Oversight of Sanctions Act, the Youth Building International Act, the Resolution on the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the Resolution on the International Criminal Court, uh, as well as the Stop Arming Human Rights Abusers. We, we need to, to promote this agenda. Uh, number seven, we need to push Biden to undo Trump's sanctions on the International Criminal Court. You don't get more lawless than that. Uh, number eight, peace activists were key to stopping a particularly egregious contender for Secretary of So-Called Defense this past week in Michelle Flournoy. We got to get ready for for who's next. Uh, there aren't any good nominees yet for anything, uh, and we need to figure out the worst ones uh, and stop them. Uh, and so there are links to what seems to have worked with Flournoy and what might work with the next one. Uh, number nine, uh, tell me if I, if I go to many of these, uh, but number nine, uh, make sure that everybody you know who's been wrapped up in team spirit partisanism is aware of what the hell's going on, that, that we're dealing with a president-elect who had no foreign policy task force, no foreign policy on his website, but the minute the election's over makes top priority nominating a bunch of war profiteers and war mongers to top positions in the coming government with an inauguration to be funded by weapons dealers, just like the last guy's inauguration. Uh, we should see if we can't shame the shameless uh, into funding that inauguration by some other means. Um, number 10, make sure, flip side of that, that everyone is aware of what we're leaving behind in Donald Trump, uh, who, yes, started no big new wars, other than a new Cold War with Russia, but expanded and escalated and made more aerial and more deadly uh, numerous existing wars, more drone murders, more civilian casualties, more bases, more weapons, tearing up, illegally tearing up key disarmament treaties, uh, threatening to use nuclear weapons publicly, dramatically increasing military spending, uh, vetoing the ending of a war. Uh, this is a guy who bragged about selling weaponry to brutal dictatorships and denounced anyone who was under the influence of the military industrial complex. Uh, you know, utter nonsense. And we're not going to see any more presidents who are going to say either of those things, but they're all going to try to follow in his footsteps in terms of his actions, just like the actions of his predecessors. Uh, unless we really change things. Um, and so we have to undo Trump policies on Iran, on Cuba, on Russia, et cetera, even while insisting on following through on a few good things that Trump pulled out of his uh, hat, let's say, uh, for, for crazy reasons, right? He wants to take troops out of Germany to punish Germany, even though the Germans want the troops out of Germany. So we have to, we have to continue with getting troops out of Germany, whether it's labeled Trumpian or not. Um, number 11, uh, we got to do the undo the damage of decades of US policy and Trump on Iran. And we have a short window, uh, you know, come, come early next summer, Iran is going to elect a government that will want nothing to do with any of this. Uh, and it will be too late unless there's actually some good faith shown early this year early 2021. Um, Biden is committed publicly to better policies on Cuba, but we need to make that happen and expand from that to ending these illegal deadly sanctions on numerous countries. Um, another thing that was new in the past four years, which ought to have always been the case, you've got corporate media outlets that will call a president a liar now. 
not consistently, not always without lying themselves about what the facts supposedly are. But if we can make that permanent, if that doesn't go away in January, we'll never have a war again. So we, we got to try to make the good new policies stick. Um, another novelty, uh, recent months, we have top military officials openly bragging about having fooled a president on withdrawing troops, in, in this case from Syria. Trump wanted troops out from Syria. They lied to him about how many were there and how many were coming out and how many were still there to make him think he was pulling a significant number of troops out when he wasn't. Uh, you know, this, this has got to bother people no matter which flavor of president they cheer for. This is, this is as dangerous as Congress forbidding the end of wars. Uh, we have to spot this maneuver the next time it happens. Um, another weird twist in the past four years is this weird liberal affection for the Cold War on Russia, for building up NATO, for keeping troops in countries, uh, for cheering for the CIA and, and the secret agencies as all of this being sort of anti-Trumpian and therefore uh, good. Uh, and, and I don't know how long the damage of this is going to last, but I think we have to try to undo it, to try to make people grasp how uh, insanely anti-Russian has Trump's behavior been, how abusive uh, and dangerous these secret agencies are, uh, how little they have to do with either intelligence or a community. Um, Number 16, when nuclear weapons become illegal in 50 plus countries on January 22nd, we need to celebrate, lobby, promote, uh, advocate. Uh, there's a whole toolkit of events and things that are happening at online events uh, at the link that I provide. Um, we need... Uh, we need to build organizations to work on these issues. We're at World Beyond War. We're starting chapters everywhere. There are all kinds of organizations that can work together uh, on these issues. Um, we need to use we need to use the the online events that have become so much a part of what we can do. Um, I, I, interest of letting you all say something or ask something i'm going to skip a bunch of these but again there are there are 27 uh, i'll give you the last two number 26 if you're in ohio elect nina turner uh and number 27 wear your goddamn mask uh and with that uh if you wanted to discuss anything i'm i'm all ears Okay, let's see if there's anybody who uh, wants to, to say a question. And, and while they're asking their question, I'll look in the chat to see if there was any written questions. Does anybody want to talk to David? I was thinking maybe uh, Connie Hammond, you might yeah. have to, something to say about Israel. Now, I, I had a question, uh, David. I mean, it's, uh, despite, uh, you know, Trump's irrational, irrationality and his kind of faux Mussolini shtick, uh, I mean, a lot of what came out of this uh, Russia, uh, you know, I mean, they seemed logical to be doing what they were doing in terms of our expansion. Remember, uh, James Baker said we weren't going to go an inch into, you know, Eastern Europe. Is that? I mean, we put troops in, in the Balt uh, in the Baltic states. I mean, we backed a coup right in the Ukraine and tried to get them in into NATO and the European uh, Union. Uh, what's Biden's policy going to be? Is he just going to go along with that incredibly weird expansionistic, uh, uh, I think, attack on, on Russia, which has caused Putin to be so reactionary? Well, remember that even though it was Trump who sent weapons into Ukraine, which Obama wouldn't even go that far, and it was Trump who organized the biggest war rehearsals in you know half a century in Europe and uh, attacked Russian energy deals and tore up agreements Russia wanted, like the Iran agreement, and illegally tore up decades old disarmament agreements uh, with Russia and refused Russian openings on cyber war and weapons in space and so forth. And was you know absolutely the worst slave of anyone in the history of slavery. And Putin should have got his money back, right? Uh, if, if all of that nonsense had any truth to it. Uh, but 
the the idea planted in the minds of at least half of the people in the United States is very, very different from the reality of the past four years. In their minds, Trump is you know, attempting to end good humanitarian wars, dismantle NATO, pull the troops out of Europe where our good European allies want them, uh, and recklessly uh, befriend dictators and enemies at the expense of allies and friends. And so the important thing is for Biden to come in and reassure our partners and allies and reinvest in NATO, which has been attacked and sabotaged. And, uh, and, and so this is you know, what, what Biden is promising and what uh, half the country is demanding of him. Uh, so it's, you know, it's a dangerous situation. Are there other questions? People can just speak up if they want. I actually was reading my dad's a lot, like, a, I don't know what you call it, when you're alumni from the military, from the Air Force, and there was an editorial. And by the tone of the editorial, it was like, it was inevitable that within a decade, we'd be at a war, in a war with China. So I haven't heard you mention China yet, but it was just like, they were just, acting like, well, in a decade from now, when we're in a war, I'm like, really? They're just like assuming this is going to happen? Uh, it, this, it, it, it's, it's eerily uh, reminiscent of the, of the 30s and early 40s and the whole buildup to a war in Asia that everybody saw coming year after year. It's, it's, it's insane. Uh, there's, there's, uh, you can find on my website a link to a webinar with a bunch of great speakers happening to this coming Tuesday night on this topic of, of war with China. Um, it's, it, it, it's absolute madness uh and, and it it doesn't have to be accepted but this is you know this is what uh, the u.s military wants to focus on and has wanted to focus on since the obama uh you know turn toward asia that continued through trump uh you know you've got i mean the chairman of the joint chiefs of staff this past week was talking about the need to close foreign military bases and i'm you know, cheering and slash passing out. Uh, and it's not because he doesn't want wars and it's not because he wants the rule of law. Uh, it's, it's because he, 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 he's, you know, apparently finding that people's spouses and families are sick of having to go live in these apartheid, Trumpian, walled in, uh, you know, little Americas far away uh, and, and be at risk. Uh, and he's, you know, he, he wants, more troops, but fewer families uh, in Asia when they managed to get a war started there. Uh, and, and according to the polling, they've got the majority of this country, the United States, believing that China is an enemy and China is a threat. Uh, and you know, China spends less than a third on its military what the United States does. And whenever the United States spends less, spends less. And whenever the United States spends more, spends more. Uh, and the, the aggression, the, I mean, Hillary Clinton is not the only person who behind closed doors has told everyone that the South China Sea really belongs to the United States and should not be called the South China Sea. And the whole Pacific belongs to the United States because the United States liberated it. Uh, and, you know, this, this is the madness we're dealing with and, we, and we're not dealing with it. It's not much in the news because it's so... It's there's so much bipartisan agreement. I mean, they just they just gave the Pentagon seven hundred and forty one billion dollars. And by most of the media accounts, you'd think it was all for renaming bases that had been named for Confederates, because that's what the disagreement was between the Republicans and the Democrats on spending, you know, seven hundred and forty point nine 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 billion on weaponry. There is, you know, there's peace and harmony and agreement on Capitol Hill, so it isn't news. Do we have anybody? I mean, we don't have Kucinich anymore. Uh, do we, I mean, Bernie, who, who do we have that would vote against a war now? Anybody? Oh, some some did vote against I'm that sure budget. Uh, but, you know, th we there are actually, I would say, more really serious anti-war 
members of Congress now than when we had Kucinich. I wouldn't say there's anyone as good as Kucinich, but uh, you know, the four female members of the squad have been extraordinarily good. Ro Khanna, I think, is the best we've got. Uh, we just saw three people elected who talk about ending wars and militarism like you haven't seen in Washington, at least in decades. And I mean, Cory Bush and Mondaire Jones and uh, Randall Bowman, um, and or I think that's his name. Uh, and uh, you know, there's 15 or 20 that are that are really pretty good. But this is out of 535. Right. A question. Go ahead. Um, a few about a month ago, I heard about a new party that was starting up that would be full of progressives and all that. But um, since then, I haven't heard of it, and I was trying to find more information on it. Um, do you? Does this ring a bell to you? And People's would that? Party. I'm sure that would be anti-war. <laughs> the the People's uh, Party. I imagine the People's Party is the one. There are a few the that People's it could party. be. Uh, I I don't. I I I think that the real danger. Uh, the, the biggest lie they tell us is about our supposed powerlessness, which is absolutely ridiculous and ludicrous. And the second biggest uh, is that the one thing you can do is vote for somebody or be a loyal member of some party every couple years and, you know, then crawl under your bed and moan for a couple years before it's time to have a chance to do something again. Uh, I think it's, 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 it's a very new and very U.S. specific sort of delusion. I mean, what has changed the world consistently for centuries now has been the thousand and one tools of nonviolent activism in which elections have played a, a minor role. Uh, and, and so, you know, I, 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 I would love it if people were all organized uh, and able to say no to someone like Biden as a lesser evil and, and able to say, we won't back anyone who doesn't meet these minimal standards. Uh, but we do have a lot to do uh, that, that isn't elections. Uh, and I think you know 99% of what we have to do isn't elections. And what you do is you, you uh, give out information, you have um, webinars, you have a radio show, you put out petitions a lot. Um, what, what can people do to not only support what it is you're trying to do and the people that you work with? I mean, obviously we can do things that are online. Is there, what else would be like the main thing you would tell the people in this call to do? Well, I tried to come up with 27 oh, of them. Okay. I don't know which is the main one. And I, I didn't get to a dozen of them. Uh, but there, I think someone posted the link to it in the chat. Um, I, I, I think it's important to, to, to be part of global and national actions and to be part of local actions. It's, 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 it's as easy as falling out of a tree to get local governments and institutions to divest from weapons, which is a great educational process for, for people in the area when you do it, to demilitarize police forces, uh, to, uh, to go after the, the pollution and other harm done by bases, uh, to create studies of conversion to peaceful industries in localities and regions and states. Uh, I mean, these are all things that are, that are relatively uh, very easy to get successes at uh, while working on the national and global scene where it's harder. Uh, and, and so it, it's, you know, it's important to, to do these online events and do these global online events that World Beyond War is doing where, where we use we and our and us to mean a global community of peace activists, not, you know, the Pentagon. Uh, and, but it's, it's, it's good to do what can be done wisely and safely in, in a pandemic uh, locally in terms of lobbying and education and agitation and protest and, uh, and nonviolent resistance. Um, you know, all the, all the many, many tools that, that have always been used to change the world. I have a question. Uh, my name is Doug. Do we have any indication what the Biden administration's plans are with regard to Iran? Because like you said, that's going to be a kind of a close window there. 
Well, the, he has always claimed and still claims that he wants to uh, rejoin the agreement uh, that was never a treaty, but was an agreement with several countries, including Iran, about Iranian uh, nuclear weapons. And, uh, and the Iranian government has maintained openness in the face of, of protests and demands from some segment of the, of the Iranian population uh, following you know, assassinations and so forth. Uh, it, it has refused to kick out inspectors and abandon the agreement. Uh, and, uh, and so there, there's every possibility, but, but Iran wants the sanctions ended. I mean, people are dying. People are dying in Iran for lack of medicine, for lack of food, for lack of, of income uh, because of these sanctions, which, which are, are punishment of a whole population in violation of the Geneva Conventions. Uh, and you know, Biden has never said he'll end all the sanctions. He's never said he'll start telling the truth about Iran. He's never said he'll, he'll stop you know, pushing Iran as a as a as a threat or claiming without evidence it's building nuclear weapons or anything of the sort, uh, and so we really we need we need good faith aggressive efforts by uh, the Biden people uh, I immediately, if not before inauguration, to say we are going to end sanctions. Uh, we are going to rejoin the agreement. We are going to open normal relations between the United States and Iran. Uh, you know, this is what's needed before the Iranian elections in June, which, which may be too late for any of that. Thank you. I, I had a question for David. Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, I just was, uh, maybe it might be a silly question, but, um, sorry, I'm trying to park my car. Um, with uh, all the organizations, I've seen it firsthand with repeal HB6, all the organizations we have fighting for the same causes that don't know about each other. Do you think there will ever be another umbrella like Bernie that we can all get under? Like I've always thought, you know, maybe we'd have like a labor party or a labor movement or uh, some, something that we could all get under that's just got a few basic things that we all agree on, like we did with Bernie with, you know, Medicare for all, education, affordable housing, stuff like that. Do you, do you foresee anything like that coming in the future? And if so, what would it be? What would it look like? Well, I, I, I have very mixed feelings about one uh, locating themselves under the umbrella of any individual uh, and, and even more so a, a politician. I mean, there was some, some things very, very good about the media attention and the energy and the organizing uh, of the Bernie campaign. Um, the, the best things about it were the ways in which the Bernie campaign was improved and improved from the previous Bernie campaign of four years earlier by organizations that hadn't identified themselves as subservient to the Bernie campaign, right? The, the anti-racist groups, uh, the, the anti-war groups. I mean, many of us publicly pe petitioned and privately met with staff and lobbied the Bernie campaign and Bernie's Senate office to do better on foreign policy. And they did much better on foreign policy the second time around than the first time around. Uh, and so I think maintaining independence and principled stands on policy uh, while working with candidates to the extent it's useful it is better. Now you could raise the same question about independent non-electoral groups working on various policies. Why don't they all unite into one big thing? Um, and you know, I, I think I, I think one reason is that they don't all agree on everything. And another reason is that, that in those areas where they do agree, they do often unite uh, much more than I think we, we often realize. Uh, and you know, groups that want the, that want the same thing on, on Yemen or on Syria or on militarized police or on you know, any particular issue, are often very big, uncomfortable coalitions that disagree on lots of other things. You know, I mean, when I was tr telling people to support Rand Paul two days ago, 
you know, but predictably enough, what did I hear? But all the millions of things people disagree and I disagree with Rand Paul on is it putting putting somebody's name on a movement, you know, creates all the problems, you know, yeah. all the things. So the reason I work with with World Beyond War is that it's global, not national, not local, and it goes after the whole institution of war. And where there are other groups that are going after a particular war or a particular weapon and so forth, we'll work with them. And the reason I work with Roots Action is that they try to go after Medicare for all and, and free college and Green New Deal and, and, and the whole list of basic first priority demands including anti-militarism, whereas most groups uh, on the left side of things that go after good demands are, are sort of, you know, PEP, you know, progressive except Pentagon, you know, progressive except Palestine. They, they, they leave out the militarism part of it. Uh, and so there, there, are, there, there are often attempts at really big coalitions uh, but they exclude, you know, they exclude a few things that are too uncomfortable for them, including the thing that takes 60% of the money Congress votes on. Yeah, yeah. no, I was, I was just, if I could just real quick follow up, I just wanted to say, uh, it was just the apathy. I feel like those big movements, I feel like that's the best weapon to fight the apathy that I feel like everyone in this group feels that we're all fighting, you know, just people not caring. Yeah. Well, I mean, Roots, a Roots Action's position, which I didn't uh, 100% agree with myself personally, but was uh, get everybody to vote for Biden and then go after him the next day. Uh, and so they're, so I'm delighted to be part of the going after him from the next day uh, part of that. Uh, and you know, the, the problem is that some people really do this lesser evil calculation and then go after him the next day. Most people, you know, within 10 minutes of picking the lesser evil candidate have started to think of him or her as the greatest good in the history of the world candidates and, and their duty to, to be on that team and, and their duty to think only thoughts that are pleasant about that team. And so, and, and, and so it's a real chore after every election to try to get people to go after uh, the candidate that they, that they voted for. Um, but obviously that's what's needed and that's the worst thing about elections is is the the, the you know the consequences it, it creates among the people you know after the election it's I mean it's when Obama moved into the White House it was too early to challenge it was too early it wouldn't be polite it wouldn't it would be racist it would be you know and, and it never ceased to be too early there wasn't any moment when everybody said oh now it's okay to, to challenge Obama and, and push him to do better. <laughs> you know, never, never, it never happened. So I just want to say Dusty is modeling the uh, repeal HB6 mask that uh, his group, along with the yard signs and <laughs> masks were given out. Thank you very much, Dusty, for those of you who don't know the him. The largest bribery <laughs> scandal in the history of Ohio. Dusty was uh, responsible for making sure everybody got their yard signs. So thank you. And if you All want, right. I guess there's still some available, right? So Connie Hammond, you, I knew you were gonna step in here with a question. Uh, David, just, you know Connie and she brought you into town before. So she got a question. Great. Yeah, David, it's so good to um, see you again. And I know you've been on a lot of webinars recently and I try to promote those. Um, just picking up on what you said earlier, um, I'm wondering if on in your list of things that we could do, um, would supporting Betty McCollum's Bill 2407 about Palestinian children in Israeli military detention, I think that might be an important bill to urge people to support too. We've been trying to get uh, more congressional co-sponsors with our Jewish Voice for Peace group. Um, this $4 billion, over $4 billion that we send to Israel, um, it, it's just atrocious. And this bill at least you know falls short in some things that would set a precedent for conditioning some of this military assistance on uh on human rights violations i 
Yes, I, I think it's it's excellent. I think it's a you know I think it's a good bill. I think it's a good effort, a good topic. I, I support it just as I support Congresswoman uh, Ilhan Omar's bill on stop arming human rights abusers. Um, I, I think I think it's a step, and I think it's a step we should take with the proper rhetoric around it, so that we're making clear to people that there isn't some way to commit genocide that doesn't abuse human rights. There isn't some proper way to use the, you know, Boeing's products, uh, you know, well, <laughs> with, that doesn't abuse human rights. And, and, and I think, you know, every, t every time Trump wants to meet the leader of North Korea or Bernie says something about Fidel Castro that falls short of, you know, burn him at the stake. Uh, people sort of freak out and say, what's happening? The forces of good in the universe are, are supporting a dictator somewhere. And I think, it, I think it would be very useful if people in the United States knew that the US government for years and years now has armed and funded and trained and supported almost every dictator and oppressive government on the planet, right? By its own definition of what are the most oppressive governments, the United States arms or trains or funds or, or more than one of those, uh, the military of 96% of them. Right, so that's the normal. You know, just talking to somebody, you know, is far better than the normal. Uh, and, and I think we should eliminate military aid from our vocabulary. I, I don't. I think it's it's it fits with humanitarian rape. I don't. I don't think there is military aid. It doesn't aid people uh, <laughs> to be shipping these these weapons. You know, the the places we think of as violent, North Africa, Middle East, Central Asia, with, with Israel and, and Saudi Arabia and a few minor partial exceptions, they, they, there's not a single weapon manufactured in the whole area. You know, where does it come? Where do all the weapons come from? Overwhelmingly, they come from the United States. It's very hard to find a war without U.S. weapons on both sides of the war. Right. It's I mean, it, pe people sort of understand that 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 the that the, the drugs were pushed on the Chinese and the alcohol was pushed on the Native Americans and they don't grasp that it's the United States and its allies and China and Russia pushing this weaponry on this poor part of the world, which just could not possibly manage to kill its people in the same way without the weapons that, that do it. It couldn't be done. Uh, I have a question uh, on that. I mean, think, think about Libya. <laughs> I mean, tens of thousands, the return of slavery. I mean, the United States consciously backed jihadist and terrorists and created that entire situation. It's documented in the WikiLeaks uh, you know, uh, leaks that, that came out. And Biden was part of that. Obama called it, you know, the worst, you know, mistake he made. I mean, doesn't he, uh, Biden have to be somewhat responsible or where do, where do we push to what limit? Because it's, and Sarkozy did it because of imperialism. That was what was in the goddamn memos. <laughs> it's like, look, we need some of their oil. We want to reestablish our military, uh, and uh, and help me at home in the elections. I mean, it's absurd and no one's accountable. No one is being criminally prosecuted for destroying the whole country and tens of thousands of people suffering. Right, I mean, imagine if we could commit horrible, brutal crimes and then call them mistakes. Oh, it was the worst mistake when I murdered that family next door. You don't get to call that a mistake, but if you do it on a thousand times the scale, oh, well, then it was just a slight misstep and poor calculation, but it was a well-intended mass slaughter. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, if you read that the email that Neera Tandon, who's now nominated for high office by Biden, wrote to her, her colleagues, she said that, you know, and, and she's speaking as someone who had advocated hard for, for attacking Libya. She said that Libya's got lots of oil and the United States has a big deficit. They should pay for it, right? So, I mean, I was in favor of Trump saying countries should pay more for U.S. bases because I thought it might get rid of some U.S. bases, right? But 
to make countries pay for the privilege of being bombed, for the privilege of being overthrown and destroyed and poisoned and turned into open air weapons markets and slave markets, to make them pay for that. I mean, this is a new level of madness, right? And uh, to take to take that crowd, to take the people who've been part of every foreign policy mistake Biden's been part of for decades and gone beyond and agreed with Trump on things Biden opposed and nominate them all for high office uh, with, you know, with, with not a one of them who isn't a board member of a weapons company. You know, it, it's, it, it's outrageous. Uh, I mean, to, to, take the, to take the destruction uh, of Libya and say, that's, that's okay to take the, the, the devastation of, of Iraq uh, and, and say, oh, well, I, and, and, and dishonestly claim to have regretted it far sooner than, than you pretended to, which is you know, Biden's current stance is, is absolutely outrageous. And, and it's, this was not permissible. I, I mean, in 2006, overwhelmingly, the voters voted to end the war on Iraq. Uh, and the Democrats, you know, took that and escalated the war in Iraq. And in 2008, it was impossible to nominate anyone who hadn't had the good fortune to not yet be in office for the war on Iraq. It, it couldn't be done. Uh, and four years later, and four years later, it took until now for the Democrats to be able to nominate and elect someone who not only was for the war in Iraq, but was the leading member of Congress, the chair of the committee in the Senate that tried to sell the war in Iraq to the public. Uh, this, is, this is the horrible step backwards because we had taken a great step forwards and prevented numerous wars because of the war in Iraq, prevented attacks on Iran because Congress members didn't want to be the jerk who voted for another war in Iraq. As the war in Iraq, like George W. Bush and Henry Kissinger gets rehabilitated, that's a problem for preventing future wars. David, uh, you wrote a book and the name of it is escaping me. It was about American exceptionalism. Curing exceptionalism. Yeah, I just wanted to promote that book. If people haven't read it, it's like really a really, really good book that everybody should read, particularly people that haven't taken Bob's class at Columbus State but you know it's kind of like what the 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 um the explanation is of why how why are we the way that we are here in this country and how how bad it is and a little bit of how we can change that I thought that was it was just really excellent book is it on your website uh yeah lots of books if you go to davidswanson.org and click on books or davidswanson.org slash books um it I mean, there, there are people who are sort of stunned into disbelief that, that Africa has done better on, on COVID than the United States, you know, that the United States is, is trailing almost the rest of the world while Trump is claiming, you know, historic accomplishments. Uh, but this is normal. The United States does worse on most things than most of the rest of the world uh, and, and consistently does worse than just about every other wealthy country on just about anything. Uh, good or decent or significant. And so I, you know, in that book, I tried to find something where the United States was number one, where it was the best at something, you know, and it, and it can't be done. And so there was, there was, to their credit, there was environmental groups who put out a report this week that didn't put in this nonsense about the U.S. needs to lead or even the U.S. needs to catch up, but the U.S. needs to do its fair share in undoing its greater share of damage to the environment. Uh, and that's the position we need on militarism as, as well as climate destruction, as well as other issues, but we can't get to it as long as there's this nonsense pretense that the U.S. is the leader, that the U.S. is the, the, the one indispensable nation that occasionally screws up, uh, you know, that, that what we need is a better flavor of patriotism. You know, we, we, have, to, we have to outgrow that nonsense. So I, I realize we've gone way past the time that we told you that this was going to be. So I hope that, I don't know if people have more questions. I hope we're not keeping you up too late or on too long. But I mean, if we can just wrap up a little bit and take the last few questions. Um, I think I said, was it Mark? Did you have something, Stansberry? Oh, just, this is a great conversation that we've had tonight. 
I think we need to do another to include more uh, uh, movements that are in, in there to uh, maybe even put together some kind of early year within the 100 year, 100 day thing um, of the administration to, to do some kind of people's forum. And it would be great that free press or uh, uh, it's, it's, it's groupies could help out with. I think it'd be a great, great thing to do. Yeah, it's been a great, the one thing that is missing is, uh, and David knows, uh, it's a, uh, he mentioned that we need to build a major coalition, right? To, to make something work. Um, can you speak a little bit more about who you would like, say your first three picks, you know, you're going NBA all-stars, who are they? Wow. Um, I, I don't know. Um, I, you know, I, I, I work on, on anti-militarism more than anything else because I don't have the capacity to work on everything uh, and because it seems the single most important thing, but also because it seems like the thing that's left out of the coalitions that could unite a bigger, stronger coalition. That is, if big environmental groups like local chapters who are totally down with it, uh, but if big, well-funded environmental groups honestly looked objectively at what are their biggest enemies, who's doing the most damage to the natural environment, as well as where is the money that we need, they would be going after militarism. If, if anti-racist groups, and to their great credit, some of them do, Black Lives Matter, um, Poor People's Campaign, do understand and act on this, but if they looked at how the militarism and the wars increase and spread the racist violence back quote unquote at home, uh, there would be absolute unity as, as Dr. King recommended years ago between anti-racist organizing and anti-militarist. Uh, if, if groups that, that wanted uh, to get guns off the streets in the United States or wanted funding for anything good or decent in the world or wanted open accountable government without the excuse of secrecy to protect from enemies. Uh, if those who wanted civil liberties and civil rights respected, if, I mean, I mean, there isn't an issue where the military isn't a big part of the problem. Uh, it's, but there are so many advocacy organizations and, and even movements that you know that that avoid that topic because it's it's uncomfortable to to go up in the face of the the flags and the songs and the you know the the hell that came down on people who took a knee during a national anthem you know bought and paid for by the pentagon uh, i so uh, so part of what i what i've worked on with with some success but a million miles to go uh, is is forming a, a broader coalition that that includes anti-militarism and and finds greater areas of of overlap by doing that. Yeah, yeah. The, the anti-colonial uh, perspective of the racial justice folks right now does open us to that ability, and I I, I encourage us to do that. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, Bob, Suzanne, great job. Is this our holiday thing? This usually December we have the, the little holiday uh, attitude, yeah, we, and I, I see you. I see you all greened up, so you're close to it. So that's good. The, banner, the old bandana. <laughs> uh -huh. um, but yeah, uh, any other questions or comments for David? Otherwise, we want to thank him very much. And uh, thank David, thank you. Yeah. It seems like we really need you and need you to continue to uh, keep writing and keep uh, sending us petitions and everybody get on his email list and you can find out what he has to say pretty much every day with an article or uh, a podcast and telling you about his radio shows, which play on WGRN at 7.30 a.m. on Wednesday mornings. And uh, anything else? No. We can go around. And Last word. Here. Last word, David Swanson, before we say. Thank you very much. Keep up the great work. Send me, uh, send me guests for the radio show and ideas and what you're working on and what I can help with. Um, keep in touch. We'd love okay. that. Thank you very much. 
All right, well, here is we wrapping up later than ever uh, on our usual uh, second Saturday salon. And I just wanted to recognize everybody. We talked to Al Gable, we saw Charlie, Mark, and Tom Sauters. Welcome, you're from Cleveland, friend of ours, Labor Party. Great to see you there. And thanks to Steve Caruso. Being our tech support and John Lasker, as usual, helping us with the free press. Yes. We got Kevin Keefe's been here the whole time, right on. And hi, Will. You Thank got your- you. It was a good program. Thank you, Al. Will, Will Perkins got his Green New Deal uh, bandana. Connie Hammond, thanks for your talk about the Central House Center and Mike Duty about the garden. Thank you. thank you and thank you for having David Swanson. He is wonderful. Yeah, yeah, we, we, it's been too long since we've had him it's around. It's been a long time. Uh, yeah. Marley, how you doing? Still in Texas? Yeah, I'm still here.